Hello and welcome to Commodore 128 Assembly Language Programming. Um, today we're going to continue working on the hash calculator. Um, I did want to mention before I get started, um, the channel recently passed um, 100 subscribers, which is kind of cool, so just wanted to say thanks to everybody that's watching or subscribing. Um, I knew it was getting close, I didn't think it had actually gone over 100 yet, but I think it was 107 when I just checked, so thank you to everyone. Um, what I want to dive into today is loading a file. Um, we've been just dealing with just you know data that we just stuck in place for our calculations, and I want to do the part that loads a file um, so that we have some actual some actual data to work with, so that we can start testing against um, you know other other calculators to make sure we're coming up with the same the same uh, values along the way. So. To do that, I um, need to do a couple of things. Um, one is going to be, basically we need a disk. So I'm going to attach a disk here. I think you can see this in the, I think this will show up in the video. Um, I'm going to attach a disk to disk to, attach a disk as drive eight. Um, let's see. And it's aggravating the way this works. doesn't work, whatever the case may be. Um, this new version, I don't necessarily know this new version of ICE that well. Okay, here we go. Create and attach an empty disk image. I just want a new disk. Um, yeah, then we're already in the right place. Um, so I'm just going to attach a simple D64 here. Um, they could work in any you know any Commodore disk drive, um, just so that we have a clean disk to save some files to for testing purposes. Okay, so then in the emulator here, if I do a directory, it just shows that it's empty. So now if we go to the monitor, um, we'll end up wanting several different files to test with different lengths and things. But for now, I'm just going to make a short one. Um, let's see, if I go to 2000 and put in, let's see, let's see if I can guess, um, see how close I can come to writing hello world in hex. Probably be way off on some of these, but uh, we'll get close and then get it closer. Um, oops. Okay. Yeah, I got a, I got a few of them right. I'm just um, I'm just inserting some hex values. Let's see. Okay, L. O T U V W P Q R Okay, so there we've got hello world in memory. And now we can save that. Let's see if we can check my Okay, so we save call this one, well, we'll call it hello for hello world. Device 8, I'm just doing all this in the vice monitor. Um, you could also do it in the 128's internal monitor. Either one would work. Um, so from 2000 to, I need to go to, I guess, let's see. See that'll be eight nine A B. 
All right. So now what do we have? It's okay. So now hello was saved on the disk, and let's see. Um. I know there's a fill command to do that, but I don't recall exactly what it is, so that was quick. So now if we load... We can see our file. Okay, I saved one byte too many, so we're going to try that again. I wasn't sure. I'm in the in the 128's built-in monitor, when you do a save in the, in the monitor, you have to give it the your uh, your end address. Your, your, you've got a start address and an end address. Your end address has to be one more than the location you want to save up to. I don't know why that is, but that's just the way it is. Um, so I want to save to A. And it can't write it because it's already there. Um, like I said, I don't, I don't know the monitor commands for some of this stuff that well. And I don't remember the Commodore commands for some of this stuff that well, because um, I haven't worked with a real disk drive in a long time. Uh, da, 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 da. Well, let's just save it as hello to. I'll straighten that out later. Okay, so hello2 is going to be the file we're going to work with for now. Um, Alright, so how do you load a file in the Commodore in assembly language? That's the deal. That's the question for today. Um, well, the, you have to do a few things. So let's create a routine here that will load a file. And I want to do a couple of things with this. First of all, there's a couple different ways we could read in the file. And I kind of went back and forth on them. But one way would be to just open the file and then read it 64 bytes at a time. Because remember, we're dealing with 64 byte blocks with our, with our uh, SHA spec. And just read it 64 bytes at a time, and then you could you could in theory read any you know read it and process it 64 bytes at a time that way there'd be no limit on the size of the file you could you could do um, the downside is I don't know if you do it that way I don't know if you get the speed of the 128 with its burst um, routines uh, when it comes to reading from disk now that doesn't really matter so much in our emulator but you know if you're going to run this on a real 128 you would like it to be able to to uh, read the file in fast and not read it at you know, Commodore 64 speed. Um, I'm not sure about that. Whether whether you uh, whether you have to make a choice there when you're when you're just reading from a file a byte at a time. I don't know if you get those routines or not. But the other reason is I think um, I'd like to use RAM Bank One. I've been looking for a reason to use the extra RAM in the 128, and this gives us a chance to do that. We can load the file into RAM Bank 1, which means we can load almost a full 64K file and process it by copying block by block into RAM Bank 0, where we actually do the work. Um, so it's just going to be, so I'm going to do it that way just because I think it'll be more interesting. And using the load routine definitely gives us the burst, the burst speed. So let's get ourselves a routine here. Let's give it a zone. Okay. So, how do you load a file? Well, let's go to our um, programmer's reference guide here. FFD5 is the load routine in the kernel. Um, and there's an example here that basically we're just going to copy almost. Um, but you have to do a few things. You have to call three, well, you have to call four 
routines in total, four kernel routines. You have to call set LFS, which sets up the logical file. I don't know what the S stands for. Symbols, maybe. Um, and so if we back up here a few pages. There it is. Set LFS. Let's see, maybe I can blow this up. It's a little easier to read in the video. Set LFS sets the channel. This is sort of the equivalent in um, when you're when you're in the Commodore itself in basic, if you do an open like open one, comma eight, comma one, or whatever you know, whatever you might do to open a channel to a drive. Um, you have to do that first and you pass you pass certain values and call set LFS. So that just that just sets the it doesn't even actually do anything. It just sets the values for talking to the drive. It just sets up the values for the channel. The other th another thing you have to do is call set name, which sets up the file name pointers. This just sets up where is the file name of the file that you're going to load. Okay. Um, so you have to call that with pointers to wherever your file name is in memory. So if you're getting the file name from the user, we're, we're just going to put the file name in there for today, but if you're later on, we'll, we'll, we'll set up an interface where a person can type in the file name and then you have to put that somewhere and use set name to point to it. Um, and if we go to set bank, let's see, I think that's further down because it's a 128, it's a new 128 thing. Yeah, it's down here. Somewhere. There it is. All right. Set bank then sets up the bank for the load because you can have the file name in one bank and the the file being loaded into the other bank. And so this is new with the 128. You didn't have this on the 64 because there's only one bank of memory. Um, but with the 128, you can you can be working in one bank, set up set up your file name there, but then say, okay, load the file in the other bank. And so that's what set bank is for. So we're gonna when we use set bank, we're gonna say, okay, the file name is in bank zero, but load the file into bank one. Okay. So you have to call that. So let me pop back up here to load then. Alright. So you have to call those three things. Oops, where am I? Okay. So before you call load, you have to call those three right here. Set LFS, set name, set bank. I don't think it matters what order you call them in. Um, and they don't even call them in that, that order in the example here. But you call those three and then you call load. Those three set everything up and then you can call load and you tell it, okay, am I doing a load or a verify? The same routine will do either one. So you have to tell it we're, we're either loading or verifying and where do we want to load it to? We'll put in the address because we want to specify a particular location. And so once you do all that, that's the equivalent of, in basic, just saying load program, you know, whatever. So we have to do this stuff. All right. And first of all, let's put a file name somewhere. Let's just put the file name at the end. Um, or actually, let's put the file name our ink file. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good place for it, I suppose. Um, and I'm not sure if we put this, if this needs to be in Petsky or at ASCII, but we will find out. Okay. Actually, it doesn't need the zero after it. back to the top. We don't need to insert this block of stuff because we're going to deal with that ourselves. 
Um, so load file needs to do those things, which I can't just copy, or I don't want to just copy um, from this PDF. We want to do it ourselves, but let's move it to that window. And, all right. Hopefully everything is still visible. I think it is. Maybe I can shrink. I'll shrink this up just a little more. All right. So we have to do the stuff on the right in our code here on the left. So first thing, we'll just do them in the order they did. First thing we want to do is call set name. So we're going to load A with the length of our file name, which is six. Hello2 is six characters. Load X with the, you know, the low byte of it, load Y with the high byte of it, and FFBD set file name. Okay. Now, we want to load A with bank 1. That's going to be the bank we're going to that's going to be the RAM bank we want to load the file into load x with 0, that's where the file name is going to be found because that's where our, that's where our program is running Oops, 0 and call call set bank alright next one is load a with now And this one, their example is a little different. Their example is actually doing a, um, in their example, they want to load the program. They want to load a program which has its destination address in the program itself, in, in the file. We're not doing that, um, so it's going to change a little bit from here on out. Um, but I don't know. Yeah, let me run, pop back up to the set LFS docs to make sure. Logical file number must be unique among opened files as used to da 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 da. Okay. I don't think it matters. I'm just going to use one. We shouldn't have any other any other files open while we're doing this, so that shouldn't be an issue. Um, actually, we're talking about device 8, and we're going to load Y with 0, unlike their example, because we want to we want to specify where it gets loaded to. Alright, so now we finally get to the load part. We've set up the file name, the bank, and the device information. Now we get to actually load the file. So we load A with one to say it's gonna be a load, not a verify. We're gonna load it in we're gonna load it at four hundred in bank one, and I'll get to why that why that is a little later on. But um, X is the low byte of that. Y is the high byte of that, so so we're going to load the file to 400 in bank 1. Alright. And if if there's an error, if it can't read the file for some reason, it sets the carry bit, sets the carry flag. And so what we'll do about that for now, just to keep things simple, we'll say branch if carry clear ahead, otherwise break. And then right here, we will return. 
Actually, there's one more thing we want to do before we return. Um, like they show here, X and Y end up with the, this. This returns the error code in A. If 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 the carry flag is set, there's an error code in A, and X and Y get the ending address. And so after you load in the file, the the end address of wherever it loaded into, wherever the you know the last byte of the file is, or it might be the the byte past the last byte. I'm not sure, but those ended up oh, and those end up in X and Y. So we're going to need a place to store those. Um, and to do that, let's just go down to the bottom and say, you know, I thought I had, I thought I had places to store things like that in this file, but I don't. So let's check this one. Okay. So we'll call it file end. We'll just put two bytes here so that we can save the X and Y at file end. And then we can get those back later because we will need to know where the file ends when we come to padding it. So, store X. X is the low byte of that. And Y is the high byte of it. And then we can return. All right. So if I've done if I've done everything right here, we can call load file up here after we init everything, and we should get our file loaded into bank one at 400. Our hello two file. We should get hello world showing up at 400 in bank one. So. Let's see. All right. Let's see what is there right now. Um, go into the monitor. We'll use the the um, we use the native monitor here because it lets you specify the bank before it lets you specify the bank number before the address when you do stuff like this. So right now that area is just empty, zeros and FFs. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and try it. Did I save? I, I didn't save a file the other day, and then I was all confused about why it wasn't doing what I expected it to do, so try not to do that again. Garbage data. Why do we have garbage data? What's wrong with my commands here? Oh, but is that it? No. Line 42. It's this one. What's wrong with my byte? I, I like the I like colons there. It just looks better. What's wrong with my byte command here? Let's make it a hex command. Does that make any difference? It does. Oh, I think the byte command requires commas. That's why the hex command doesn't. All right, so we've assembled and In. It looks like everything is is there. So I, I saved and assembled correctly. So let's run it. Okay, stuff happened. Um, the screen got messed up, which is interesting. Um, why did the screen get messed up? Let's see. Screen got filled with a bunch of junk for some reason. Now, why would that be? Hmm. 
not only the screen, but it's like the characters. Hmm. Doesn't seem like it touched bank one. Something weird happened there. I'm not sure what yet. Let's see. Let's simplify this a little bit. Let's break after our load so that the other stuff doesn't try to happen. Break right there. Alright, assemble again. Let's load again. Same thing happened. Um, where did it break at? I can't see where it broke because it messed up the screen. Um, C260? Is that where it broke at? I mean, that's, that's got to be one of the kernel routines, but um, why it would end up there, I don't know. Let's see. 250, let's say. C258. Let's check another one of the C258. Let's check the mapping the mapping book here if that comes up. It accepts a line of keyboard input and returns the first character. Why would it be calling that? That's interesting. to see if I forgot any or added any incorrect um, direct addressing things as I sometimes do. Doesn't appear that I did. Okay. Um, Alright, well, here's what we'll do. Let's re whoop, reset. program at 1300 is getting a little bit clobbered too apparently and look well that's not what my program starts with is it no what the heck is going on here okay it is what my program starts with my program starts with push a really that's the first thing that happens. A source. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, I'm an idiot. Okay. I created this ink file. Yeah, this is just me being stupid. Um, I created this ink file as a place to keep all these definitions. 
But by putting this stuff in here, these two lines are actual data. These two lines are actual bytes that are going to end up in the program. So by putting them in the ink file, which I call at the beginning, that means they're showing up before my code, which means when I jump to 1300, I'm actually jumping to this stuff instead of jumping to the beginning of my program. So they got to go. They got to come out of here. And they can just be at the end of this file. That's where I was going to put them originally, and then I thought, no, let's be more organized than that. All right. So let's assemble that and load it. Let's see what that looks like. Yeah, that looks a little better. So we jumped. We jumped to the init routine, and then we jumped to the load file routine and then we break so that's what we want searching for hello 2 loading break okay come over here to the monitor the internal monitor and let's check at 400 in bank 1 and there's hello world there's our there's our data loaded in there's our file loaded in from disk all right so that works had a little confusion there but it works all right, so the next thing is we have to figure out how to pad it. And to do that, let's first of all get this out of the way. Let's come back to our spec here. You have to pad the data out to 512-bit blocks, which are 64 bytes. So whatever we've got has to be expanded to the next 64 byte block. Right now we've got 11 bytes, so it's going to have to become a single 64 byte block. Um, oh, one more thing we wanted to check did um, is whether, let's see, back to the program here, whether our X and Y got saved into file end correctly. And since they're down here at the bottom of the program, that's going to be hard to tell. Um, in fact, let's move them up. They can't be at the top, but they can be right here, where the code is never, it's never going to get to that point anyway, because it's always going to break. So they can be right here, where it's a little easier to look at them. So, one more test before we move on to the next thing. Searching, loading, break. Okay, so now, um, They should be right after, yeah. There's our file name, and so right after the file name should be the end of where it loaded into, and that is right here, 0409, and so that's the last that's the last byte of where it loaded into, and it is actually the next. It's it's actually the byte after the last byte. If you look. Over here in the Commodore, if you look over here in the 128's monitor, 44, the D in Hello World, is at 0408, and then 0409 is actually the next byte. So I've, I had a feeling that's probably how it works. So after the load runs, it puts the next, the very next byte, the address of the very next byte after the data got loaded in, in the X and Y registers, which we then saved at file end. And so that'll be where we start to pad it from. All right, so back to the code here and back to our spec. So to pad it out, you add a one bit after the original message. Now, in theory, your data doesn't have to be in bytes. Your data could be in bits and it could end in a in a number of bits that are that that aren't divisible by 8. Ours always will because we're dealing with bytes, um, so we don't have to worry about that. But in theory, you're putting that one bit after the message, and it just goes after the message. Um, for us, that'll be simple. Then you put an 8-bit length at the end, or an 8-byte length at the end. So the length of the the length of the original data, like ours is 11 bytes. So we're going to have to put 11 at the end but we're going to put it there in a 64-bit value, even though we're never going to have a we're never going to have a length more than 16 bits. It's just the spec says you put a 64-bit value at the end. 
and then you pad in between the data and the one bit and the length with zeros until you have exactly, you know, until it comes out evenly at 64 bytes per block, or comes out evenly at blocks of 64 bytes. So if we look at, let's just make a line of 64, just so we can think about this. So there's a line 64 bytes long, or the, the, we'll let the equal signs represent bytes. So then let's imagine our data has 11, all right, then we put the one bit right after that, so that's going to be a byte that just has a one at the very first, the a one in the very first byte, which will actually that'll be eighty in hexadecimal like that. Then at the end, the last eight will have to be, will have to represent eleven, and so there will be an eleven right here. I'll just put an e for eleven, and then let's see, and then it'll be well eight bytes I said so like that so there will be the length at the end and then everything in the in between gets filled in with zeros All right. so that's what we have to do to pad it um, now where it's where it gets a little bit tricky or a little bit trickier than this is let's say your message is like sixty bytes long that'd be 60 exactly let's move it up so I can tell where I'm at okay there's 60 bytes for a message well now you don't have room for the length on the end and so you're gonna have to you're gonna have to put your one bit and then add another 64 byte block so that you can put your length at the end and then this will be 60 whatever whatever that is in hex. So that's what you have to do when you're padding. You have to figure out, do we need to add another 64 byte block on the end of this so that we have room to add our length? Because you, you're always going to need to add at least nine bytes. One byte to hold your one bit and then eight bytes to hold your length. And so you got to figure out, do we have room for nine in the current block, in the space we have left in the current block, or do we need to add another block and then pad both blocks out with zeros? The other thing is, um, this data is in is in bank one. Our program is in bank zero. Now, that means that we're going to have to run this particular part of our program. The part that does this is going to need to run in a in a part of memory that's shared between the two banks. Um, you. You don't have to have shared memory, but you basically have to to be able to use both banks because you have to be able to, when you switch banks, when you, when you switch from RAM bank 0 to RAM bank 1, your program has got to be able to keep running. And so even though you just switch to the other bank, your program still has to be there. You know, at least at least the next instruction has to be there for it to be able to, to just keep running. Um, so by default, the first 1K of memory, which includes zero page and everything up to 300, so you've got from zero to zero up to 03FF, by default that is shared. And that's that's 1K, 1K of memory that's shared. And the rest is not. Now you can change that, you can change it, you can configure it so that more than more is shared, like you can share 4K, 8 or 16 I believe is the highest you can go. You can also change it so that the top of memory is shared instead of the bottom. So you can put the shared part at the very top, um, or you can even put it at both ends. Um, we're just going to stick with the default because I think that's going to give us enough space to use to do what we need to do. <coughs> what that means is we're only going to be able to process up to about a, about a, almost a 63k file because we can only load we can't fill up bank one completely with a file or otherwise we'd have no place to we'd have no shared memory in which for our program to sit and do this stuff um, so we'll and that's why we're loading our file at 400 that's that's right above the shared area so we'll load in our file at 400 and just to wherever it needs to go 
you can't quite go to the very top because the MMU register sits at FF00, you can't write that. Um, so technically we can load in 62.75k of data and process it. That's our limit. And we're not likely to run into a file um, bigger than that, so that's okay. And maybe it, maybe at some point we'll, you know, maybe when this is done and it works on a single file, maybe we'll adjust it so it can also do any length of file and just pull it in one block at a time. We'll see. That might not be very difficult to do once everything else is done. Um, so what this means is the piece of code that does the message padding is going to have to sit in the shared memory. So where do we want to go in the shared memory? Well, if we flip back over here, I think I had that, which book I had open to the right spot. I think it was that one actually, and I moved it. Um, find my location back. All right. This is the this is computes mapping the 128. It's probably the most detailed in what is in what is in memory, what all the locations do. But basically, you know, it goes through a zero page. Here's all the zero page stuff, and it goes through byte by byte what everything and what everything is used for in zero page. Um, I don't know if it has every single detail, but it has a lot. Um, and then you get to the stack, which is in page one. We could use some of the stack area because we're not going to fill the stack, um, but um, then you get to page. Then you get to page two, and the first 160 bytes of page two are used for an input buffer for basic and the monitor. So what happens in this area is every time you type a command in basic or in the monitor, um, your command, which there's 100, there's commands can be 160 characters long. That's why it's that long your command gets saved here while the program works on it. And so there's this 160 character space here that is not going to get used while our program is running because we're not using basic or the monitor inside our program. So what we can do is we can put our code here in this area and run it when we need to do something over in bank one. Um, because this is within, you know, this is within that shared area. So code that's in this 200 block or the 300 block, but the 300 block is really busy. Um, code that's in this 200 block is in both banks as long as we stick with the default configuration. So we have from 200 to 2A0 as our space that we have available. Now we're going to have to put code here that does two things. One thing is going to be padding the you know, padding the message, which you, which we've been talking about. The other thing is going to be copying blocks of the message into bank zero where we can do all the stuff, all the code we've already written, all the processing on the block. Um, we'll have to have a, a chunk of code in this area that can copy 64 bytes from bank one into bank zero. And th that means we'll also need 64 bytes of this area to do that with. Um, we could make it smaller, we could go down to 32 bytes or whatever and do multiple copies, but I'd like to, I'd like to be able to use I think with 160 bytes available, we can say, okay, 64 of that is a buffer so that we can copy from bank one, copy 64 bytes into that buffer, and then copy them into bank zero. And then the other 96 bytes, I think we can fit our code in there that we need, that we need to be in there. Um, let's see, what was I, I was gonna say something, oh, there, there's some, there's some code already in this um, 200, 200 block, block two, whatever we want to call it. There's some code here already that is kind of specifically for the same thing, for fetching and writing values into a different bank. But this code, this is code that the kernel automatically puts in this location every time the computer starts up. I could use this code and not write our own, but the problem is it's it does one byte at a time. Um, and so if we want to copy 64 bytes, we would have to set some things up, tell it, okay, get a byte from 400 in bank one. Okay, write that byte, 
to six to to C hundred in bank zero. Okay, now go get another byte from four hundred one in bank one, write it to C hundred one in bank zero. There's a, there's some setup and teardown costs. There's there's some overhead basically, and every time you do that, and the routine has to be switching banks every time, and the bank switching isn't all that is not that complicated, but it's still it's got to do it 128 times then to copy 64 bytes. Um, if we write our own, we can just switch banks once, copy 64 bytes, switch banks again, copy 64 bytes. Um, I think that'll be considerably better. So that's the idea here. We're gonna we're gonna set aside 64 bytes in starting at 200 in this buffer area. And then above that, above that 64, so starting at 240, we're going to stick just enough code to do the things we need to do over in bank 1. That's the idea. So, all right. So how do we do that? Well, let's start a routine called pad message. Zone, probably. Okay, and we'll just say pad the message according to spec. And we'll enter the return. And there we go. All right, so this routine is going to be in our program. It's not going to be, when we load our program, our program loads in at 1300 right now, and we could load it somewhere else, but we can't load the whole program down in the 200 block. There's not enough room. So our program is going to get loaded at 1300, and then we're going to have to have another, just a little routine that says, okay, copy pad message down to 200 or two, 240, actually. Okay. So first we'll write pad message, and then we'll, we'll write the thing that does that. So what pad message needs to do as well, with all the things we talked about before. Um, it's got to pad the message. So how do we do that? Well, remember that when it finishes loading the file, file end right here is pointing to the byte right after the you know, right after the last thing. And so that is where we're going to have to write our one bit. So we can do that pretty easily. Um, yeah, the first thing we're, well, I guess we're gonna want we're gonna want file end in zero page. Um, so that we can do indirect addressing on this stuff. Yeah, so instead of putting file end just here in the program, let's put it in the zero page. So let's go back over to our ink. And I need to go through and change. Uh, I know some of these we don't need anymore, so I'm going to have to clean some things out. Um, do we use F1 res or F2 res anymore? We don't use F1 res, do we use F2 res? Yes, we still do, okay. Well, I'll probably go through that and figure that out and make some notes and then and then walk through it. But for now, let's use using quite a bit of zero page at this point. Um, well, we can use a couple. We can use we can overload one of these temp locations because we're not going to use this while we're we're not going to we're not going to be loading the file and or let's put it this way: we're not going to be padding the message and processing the message at the same time, which is going to be one or the other, although, well, no, that's not quite true. Well, no, that's true, but 
we're going to need to know where the file ends as we as we load as we load blocks. So we can't clobber that. We can't clobber where the file ends. Um, okay. Well, anyway, I'm spending too much time trying to save a couple of bytes and zero page. Let's just do file end. Like I said, we'll 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 find some savings here at another time. Um, where the file or the the end of the file loaded into RAM. Okay. Like I said, it it begins. It, actually, to be more accurate, we'll say one byte past the end of the file because that's actually what it gives us. Let's forget to put this thing in the best possible place. Okay. So it's always one byte past the end of the file. That's going to make more sense when we get to subtracting and things to see where we're at. All right. And then file end should still... Yeah, that should still work here with our... It's just going to be in zero page now instead of in, in the middle of our program. All right, so let's see here. First of all, we need to know our length. We need to calculate the length. So how do we do that? Well, we subtract the end from the beginning, or we subtract the beginning from the end. So um, let's see, do I have a place to save the length? I think maybe I did. No, I don't. OK. Um, let's see, our length, our length won't ever be longer than 16 bytes, so or 16 bit, sorry. Length of file. All right. So this will be the original length. And so to calculate that, we need to subtract our starting point of 400 from where it ended up. So we want to load A with, um, let's see, we got to start with the high byte. So we got to load A from file end plus one, set carry, and then subtract. I guess that's right. I guess you start with the high byte, not the low byte. And store that into length plus one. And then load A with the low byte of file end. Subtract, well, we don't have to subtract anything because that's going to be, that's zero. We don't need to subtract zero. Yeah, that we don't really have to. We don't have to worry about the carry here because we're starting at zero, and so we can't be subtracting anything less than. And anyway, there there can't be a carry issue, and so load A with file and store that into length. All right. All right. So we've stored the length now, and so we'll use that when we get to when we get to padding out the end of the of the thing. But first. Basically, what we got to figure out is, do we need to tack on another 64-byte block, or is there room in the one that we're dealing with right now? Um, so the question then is, is if we take the length and we divide it by 60, you know, dividing by 64 would give us the number of blocks, but we don't care about that, I don't think. <clears throat> what we want to know is how many bytes are there right now in the last block. Now we only have one block and we already know there's 11 bytes, but how do we find that out? Right now length is going to say 11, 
but what if length said, you know, 256 or, you know, 3,500, whatever, whatever it might be, how do we find that out? Well, the way to find that out is to look at the low byte of length and mask the top two, the top two bits. So we already have the length, we already have the low byte of length in A. If we end that with 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, we eliminate the top two bits, which just leaves us the bottom six telling us within a 64 bit block or 64 byte block how many bytes are there because the top two bits represent 128 and 64 and so you're saying okay let's instead of a six instead of 256 where are we within a block of 64 and that'll tell us that and so now we have how long is our how long is our block how long is our last block within a 64 byte block instead of within us within a 256 byte block if that makes sense if you think let, let's say um, let's just say the the block was f0 long or let's let's say f5 long okay well in binary that's 1111 so you say okay, but if you're just looking at the last 64 byte, the last 64 bytes of it, what is it? Well, then you, you mask away those two, and then you say, oh, okay, well then this becomes three five, and three five represents 48 plus five, 53. So then you say, okay, well then our last 64 byte block has 53 in it, and so that's what we're dealing with. All right. So the question then is, how long does it have to be before we need to tack on another block? Before we need to, to to add another block to give us room for padding? Well, we said we need we need room to put in nine bytes, the one bit and the and the eight byte length. So you know, sixty four minus nine, we can't have any more than fifty five already in the block. Um, now. Just think here for a second. Um, yeah. Yeah. So if we take our number, let's let's say fifty five, or well it's let's say eleven. We we've got eleven right now. To figure out how many zeros we're going to need to pad it with, we say, okay, we've got our 11 bytes for our data. We have one byte for the for the one bit, and we have eight bytes for the length. If we add those up, 11 plus 1 plus 8, that's 20. Subtract that from 64, we're going to have 44 bytes to pad out with zeros. So what we can do is subtract our current length which we've which we've just figured out here the length of the last block we can subtract that well that plus 9 from 64 which is the same thing as subtracting that from 55 yeah so if we subtract that number from 55 we know how many bytes we have left in this block to pad out so Let's say it's 11, we say 55 minus 11, we have 44, byte, 44 bytes to pad out. What if we have 60 bytes? Well, now we have minus 5 bytes to pad out. That's, that's not good. That tells us we need to add another block. How do we add another block? We just add 64 to the number of bytes we're going to pad. And then we know we need to pad it out with 59 bytes. So I hope that makes sense. Um, basically, yeah, to figure out how many bytes to figure out how many bytes to pad before we put on the before we put the length on the end, 
we subtract our current length from 55. If that gives us a negative number, we add another 64 to that, and then pad out that many, and then put our length on the end. Okay. I think that's I think that's right. We'll. Uh, and that's why I said we'll need some different test files to to um, make all this work, you know, to make sure it works in each case. But let's go ahead and do that. Um, so we've got our we've got our number, whatever our number is. We want to subtract it from 55. Um, can we do that, or how do we want to do that? Okay, well, let's just transfer it to another register for now. Wait a second. That won't work. I can't subtract another register from A. I was just thinking here about um, the best way to do this, and I can't. Uh, I can't subtract another register from from A. I've got to put it in a memory location. Um, so let's let's use temp1. We're not using that while we're padding messages. Um, and then we need to load A with 55 in decimal. And set the carry, subtract. We do we do want the, the carry set in this case. Um, Set the carry, subtract temp one. All right. Now the question is, did we end up with a negative number? Well, if we did, the carry will be clear, because yeah, yeah. If we did, the carry will be clear because uh, that's the whole point. Is you set the carry, then you subtract. If the carry was needed, basically, a, I've said this before, but the carry flag is really a borrow flag when you're subtracting. It's there to be borrowed if, if you need to borrow. So in the case of 55, 11, 55 minus 11, the carry flag will stay set because it wasn't needed. Down here, it'll be cleared because it was needed, to, and it was needed because 60 is more than 55. So what we can do then is branch if carry clear ahead Otherwise, we want to add 64. So, load A from temp1, clear the carry, add with carry 64, and uh, let's see. And then that's where you branch to head to. So, because I don't need to load it from temp one, because I just wait a sec. Stop and think about this. We stored the length into temp one, loaded fifty five so that we could subtract temp one from it. Okay, yeah, we don't need to load from temp one here. We've already got, so we've got the value in A already. Yeah, because we loaded it with, we loaded A with 55, subtracted temp one from it, and then said, if the carry is clear, we're done, branch down here. Otherwise, clear the carry and add 64 to A. And so at this point, A then has our number, our, our padding length. Okay, so that is the number of bytes that we're going to want to pad our message. So to start padding then, the first thing we want to do is, let's see here.
Yeah, the first thing we're going to want to do is just put our put our one bit on the end. So we're going to store, we're going to, well, first thing we want to do is transfer that to something else. Put it in another register so we can get at it when we need it. If we, if we, if we need that register for something else, we'll put it off into memory. But for now, we'll just put it in X. And so let's change that. So now we want to load A with 80 because that's our one bit and store that at file end because remember file end is pointing to the next byte after the end of our data. But it's not going to be, right, let's see, we've got to load Y with 0 because we're going to do indirect addressing here. File end is a location, a, the two byte location and zero page that we set up. And so we're going to store that into file end Y. Okay, so that's indirect addressing. And now we need to increment file end. So we do that by increment file end. And then branch if not equal, ahead. Otherwise, increment file end plus one. And then there's our plus. Okay, now the reason for that is we don't know exactly where we are. We could be right at the end of a page. We could be sitting at, you know, 4 FF. And so when we store our one bit in 4 FF, the next location in memory is going to be 500. And so we've got to make sure we increment file end as a, as a two byte thing. Um, all right. So we've stored the one bit, we've incremented file end. Now we need to store an increment file end x number of times to add the rest of the padding. All right, so to do that, we already have our number of times in x. So we just want to load a with zero because we're going to pad it with zeros. Store that into file end, comma y, and then I'm just going to copy this stuff because we just want to increment file end again. Actually, you know, well, shoot. Yeah, I was going to say we wouldn't have to do that because we could just increment Y. But I want file end to end up at the end of the file. <laughs> this is the thing. Um, so, so that's all right. Um, yeah, we'll just do it that way. Um, and then decrement x, branch of not equal, back up to here, which will be right here. Okay, so at that point we've padded, padded x bytes, or x zero bytes. Okay, now we're to the length. Now the length is an 8 byte value, a 64 bit value. We, we will never use more than 16 bits because we only have that much memory to fill up. So we can go ahead and assume that the first six are going to be zeros and then the last two are going to be our, our length value that we've already saved. So we can actually come back up here and change this to 70 and let, let this little loop right here add them for us. Okay. So X has padding length plus six because we plus six for um, for length zeros, let's say. All right. So then file end is going to be pointing to the last two bytes, or should be. Um, and so now we just need to put the length there, and the length goes high byte first. So we want to load a from um, length plus one. 
and then do this and and then do that again but with length and so once we get all the way down here then file end should be pointing to the next byte after the end of our block which our block should be an even 64 and so file end should be pointing at a 0 or a 65 or 129 or whatever the third possibility is. There should only be four possibilities. Um, all right, now that's kind of kind of making me itch how much duplication there is here. So I may want to split some of this stuff off into a separate routine. But um, time is running a little bit long here. So let's go ahead and see how this works um, with our with our um, test file. So we just expect it to load in and pad out that, that one block in this case. So the block should end up padded out with zeros. We shouldn't have those FFs in there. And the very last byte should be 11, which will be 0B. Um, that's what we should end up with. So let's assemble. Oh, I've got a problem. Value not defined, pad message. No, oh, I got an extra D somewhere. Pad message. Oh, must be up here. Oh, there it is. I have my keyboard set kind of fast so that I don't have to hold my fingers as long to repeat things, and sometimes it's a little too fast. Um, okay, what's the message here? 61, 66. Did I get a plus where it shouldn't, where it doesn't belong somewhere? Oh, down here. Yeah. Right there. And right there. Okay. Yeah, I, I have a feeling I'm going to want to change that and uh, simplify that because that, that's bothering me already. All right, load the program, run the program. Okay, let's switch over to the monitor and the 128, and let's look at the block. Oh, sorry. Um, right now, pad message isn't working on block one. Like I said, we have to copy it into the 200 block. Well, we're just going to have to deal with that next time, but let's... Um, Loaded it into bank one. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's, um, file end. Let's see. Where is file end? Balance at 84. Okay. 480. Okay, so that worked. Um, sort of. It did. It did extend it. But it seems like they gave it two blocks. So there might be something wrong with my subtraction routine um, because it shouldn't need two blocks for 11 bytes that's unnecessary um, if we look at 0400 to 047f well that's the, that's the screen memory and so it's not in, in block in block zero that's screen memory so we can't tell what it had when the program actually ran um, if we come over here, do it again. You can tell it kind of goofed up the screen in a few places. Um, yeah. So, 
we'll have to come back to that next time. Um, so for next time, we're gonna we're gonna get pad message to copy itself, um, or not? Well, not get it to copy itself. That's the other reason pad message is gonna have to be smaller than that. Um, this thing is this thing is probably too long to be copying into that space. So we're gonna have to simplify some of this into a subroutine. Um, but we'll get to that next time. We're gonna have to copy pad message into the 200 block so that it can work on bank one and then debug it and see why it's adding another block when it really shouldn't want to. So that's it for this time. Um, we'll get that straightened out next time. So hope this was interesting and thank you for watching.